Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is Judge Lopez. Today is December 18th. I'm going to call the 230 case Sorrento Therapeutics on a couple of matters. Um, before I forget, I want to wish everyone a happy holiday. Um, let me go ahead and take appearances in the courtroom, and then if anyone wishes to make an appearance on the phone, uh, I just ask that you please hit five star. There's a little over 80 people on the line, and I want to keep the line muted. Uh, so let me take appearances in the courtroom. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Caroline Reckler and Chris Harris of Latham and Watkins on behalf of the debtors. Also on the Zoom in the event we need any exhibits is my colleague Jonathan Gordon and uh, Mr. Momeji, the debtor's CRO, is also on the Zoom. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Cy Schmidt, Glenn Ager, Bergman, and Fuentes on behalf of the Official Equity Committee. All righty. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Matthew Kavanaugh from Jackson Walker, also appearing on behalf of the debtors. And, Your Honor, uh, not to uh, get in my help, head of myself or violate the one right, one ranger rule, but uh, I don't think any of the motions pending today seek relief against uh, my firm as an applicant, but considering some of the allegations contained therein, uh, if it's appropriate, uh, I would like to uh, start with a you know, brief opening and then participate as necessary, if, if, if necessary. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Tom Kirkendall on behalf of Elizabeth Prinker. Good afternoon, Mr. Kirkendall. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Julie Harrison with Norton Rose Fulbright on behalf of the Official Committee of Unsecured Creditors. Good afternoon. Mr. Duran, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Hector Duran with the Department of Justice on behalf of the U.S. Trust. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, let's see, I will unmute lines, but I will let everyone know today was an in-person hearing, so all argument will take place here in front of me today. That's the, but if anyone, ready? Here's an 832 number. Judge, this is Tim Culberson. Um, I, I, want, I received your order oh. today, and I just want to let the court know that I'll be refiling as a non-emergency motion and I'll get it set for no, hearing. Mr. Corbison, I, I appreciate that. I don't think you need to. Why don't we just have my case manager reach out to you? We'll just treat that motion as a regular motion and we'll just get it on normal notice and we'll pick a hearing date for you. I don't want you to have to refile anything. Oh, okay. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate that. Okay. Not a problem at all. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. We are here on a couple of matters. Uh, Ms. Reckler, why don't I turn things over? You, it sounds like there's a, we've got a seventh monthly fee statement and then a motion for a protective order and other stuff. So why don't we just take them in order? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, for the record, Caroline Reckler of Latham and Watkins on behalf of the debtor. Your Honor, we did file an agenda at docket number 1668. Um, the good news is the first item on the agenda has been resolved, and those were the orders you entered related to FINRA and DTC on, um, I think those were entered on Friday. So thank yeah. you for that. And can I just note there, uh, I, I know Mr. Progress was there. I, I know that there were a number of parties who may be listening in. I just wanted the parties to know um, that there was an, a hearing requesting uh, a 2000 for exam of certain banks and to FINRA. Uh, there was an initial hearing about, um, I'd say a couple of weeks ago, um, Mr. Provis will hold me honest on that, but uh, the, the, the hearing was rescheduled with respect to FINRA to allow FINRA to get notice of the motion to provide due process to make sure that that could happen in between the time that that was rescheduled till today. Uh, the debtors, I should say, um, the probing parties, uh, Mr. Provis's client, um, uh, reached that reached a settlement agreement um, on some documents with respect the scope of a 2004 exam with with Finra. Uh, there was an agreed order that was uploaded, and I signed it um, with respect to that. So it sounds like that process will take care of itself, and that process will run its own course, and the parties will come back to me. I don't think there's anything else I need to do with respect to that. But uh, essentially, the relief was granted as per the agreement. And the subject of that agreement is filed publicly on the docket if anyone wants to see that. So, Mr. Reckler, I just wanted to make sure that people understood that there was a, there, that issue was resolved. And if anyone was looking for that, that they could see what I signed on the docket. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Sorry about that. Your Honor, the second item on the agenda was the Equity Committee's objection to the Latham & Watkins September fee statement. Um, the Equity Committee filed a notice late Friday at docket number 1673, indicating that they were not going to pursue the objection to the Latham and Watkins September fees on an interim basis, but they did reserve their rights to object um, on a final basis, which is how the interim comp compensation procedures are drafted and, and so provide. 
Um, Your Honor, I do just want to make a few notes about what was said in that notice. Um, the Equity Committee claims that the purpose of its objection to our September fee statement was to address the debtor's liquidity, um, and they wanted the debtor professionals to finance the further development of the debtor's drug, Avitso. Um, and they also noted that Latham was entirely, entirely refused to negotiate with them on the fee objection. And I, and I just want to note a few things. Um, the first is to emphasize the underlying motive of the Official Equity Committee's uh, objection, and we noted that in our response. The committee objected to our fees not because they were purportedly unreasonable, but because the committee wanted more money to finance these cases. Neither the debtor's investment banker, the creditor's committee professionals, or the equity committee's own professionals have been able to find further financing that is actionable and that makes sense in light of where the debtors are in these cases. The debtors, professionals, are advisors. They are not and cannot and should not be forced to be investors. And that in and of itself would raise a whole host of issues. But Your Honor, that is the motive. And I think you will see that the Equity Committee has noted that more than once in their own papers. Your Honor, to be clear, despite the fact that equity is out of the money, the debtors' advisors have continued to share information and to keep the official equity committee advisors in the loop and apprised of all case developments. We have not refused to mediate or discuss anything in these cases, and I certainly did not refuse to negotiate their objection to our September fees. As soon as we received the equity committee objection, I reached out to them and I offered to have a meet and confer, though it did not result in any resolution. And when we declined their last settlement offer, which again was a request that the professionals finance the case, I offered a call to discuss our reasons, but the equity committee did not take me up on that offer. And I think it's also noteworthy that the official equity committee requested that the fee issues be mediated with Judge Isker and that Judge Isker declined to mediate. Your Honor, so that's all I think needs to be said in connection with the September monthly fee statement. And with that, I'll turn the podium over to my colleague, Mr. Harris, who will address the third item on the agenda, and that's the discovery matters. Well, hold on a second, because I still want to, me, just give, sounds like the Equity Committee wishes to make a statement, and then I'm, before we turn to the third matter. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Again, for the record, Cy Schmidt for the Equity Committee. It's a pleasure to be here in person. Pleasure. Um, I just want to make a few comments about um, Ms. Reckler's statements. The reason we filed a fee objection was not because we, the, the reason for filing the fee objection was not to generate liquidity. The reason we negotiated with, or tried to negotiate um, with Ms. Reckler's client on the fee objection was because obviously liquidity is highly important in this case, and that's no secret. Um, the, the basis for objecting to the fees are laid out in our objection, and I think a lot of it may tie to the third matter on the agenda, which is our 2004 uh, motion. Any information that we can get out of that process, I think, could be highly relevant for any future fee objections. So we just thought, as a matter of econo um, judicial econo economy, it would make more sense to hold off on the fee objection. Like Ms. Reckler said, we reserve our right to object to the final fee applications and hopefully by then we'll have all the relevant information. Thank you. Does Thank anyone you. else wish to be heard in connection with the interim com? A short statement. Sure. Your Honor. Um, as of today, unless something changes, we have no issue with Latham and Watkins because they denied any knowledge of the relationship between Liz Freeman and Judge Jones. At this point in time, we have no basis to disbelieve that. And so I just wanted to make that clear on the record right now. Thank you very much. Otherwise, I'm just monitoring today's hearing. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me then note for a couple of things before you get up, Mr. Hatton. I, I, I know that there's no technically now uh, not an objection. I still think I have an independent duty to rule on the matter. So I want to note, right, I still, it still has to meet the standard. Uh, and there's been an objection filed, and now the objection is withdrawn, but technically the hearing still has to go forward, right? Um, so I'm going to note that on April 13th, 2023, a docket number 442, the bankruptcy court entered an order establishing procedures for interim compensation and reimbursement for professionals. 
states that professionals may file a fee statement with this court seeking compensation for services provided in a month. That's what we're talking about. In each interim fee application, professionals must apply for compensation for professional services rendered and reimbursement of expenses incurred in connection with the Chapter 11 cases in compliance with Sections 330 and 331 of the Bankruptcy Code, applicable provisions of the bankruptcy rules, the Federal Rules of Bankruptcy Procedure, and the Bankruptcy Local Rules for the Southern District of Texas. Right? Parties and interests have until 4 p.m. Uh, on the date that's 14 days after the monthly fee statement is filed to object to the request of fees and the objecting party is required to set forth the precise nature and the basis of the objection and the amount at issue. On October 27th, at docket number 1474, the firm, what I'll call Latham, filed its seventh fee statement covering the period between September 1, 2023 through September 30th of 2023. That's what's at issue today. That's what was at issue in this particular matter, just the September 1 through September 30th fees. Um, on November 9th, 2023, um, it looks like e um, the Equity Committee emailed Latham a formal objection based upon their own statements uh, that objected to the requested maximum monthly payment based on, on what it says was based on this suspected misconduct involving uh, Ms. Freeman and former Judge David Jones. And then on November 28th, 2023, at docket number 1607, the official Committee of Equity Security Holders filed their formal objection. The Equity Committee argues that no fees should have been paid to Latham until the, until the Equity Committee could fully investigate the relationship. Second, the Equity Committee uh, argued that Latham's fees are excessive in light of the quality of service rendered and that they're disproportionate to the projected recoveries in the case. On December 15th at 6.38 p.m. Central Standard Time, uh, docket number 1673, the Equity Committee filed a notice and a reservation of rights about, the, about their objection says that the Equity Committee had hoped to negotiate a consensual resolution to the fee objection that would have provided liquidity to fund the remaining payments to, needed to bring Ovidzo to market in China. Uh, but they said that Latham refused to cooperate with the Equity Committee and a compromise would attack potential resources for liquidity for the debtors as estates now appears impossible. They said it's unfortunate because uh, any fee concessions and reductions won't save Ovidzo now. And so, but they said in the interest of judicial economy, the Equity Committee didn't intend to pursue its fee objection at this hearing, which they have not. And, and I take their statements at their word without prejudice to the Equity Committee's rights to object at the final allowance. Section 331 of the Bankruptcy Code permits all professionals to submit applications for compensation and reimbursement on an interim basis. Section 330. A1 sets forth the standard for reviewing the reasonableness of requests for compensation. Okay, so there's a standard of reasonableness, right, um, here. Um, and the court is to consider under Section 330 the nature, the extent, the value of services, taking into account all relevant factors, including the time spent, the rates charged, uh, whether such services were necessary for the administration or beneficial at the time that they were rendered. You look at this, and Fifth Circuit case law confirmed. You look at you look at the, the you evaluate whether a service was reasonable at the time that it was made. You don't kind of apply hindsight to it. You look at it at the time that it was made, and you determine whether at the time it appeared that it was reasonable, right? Whether the services were necessary, whether the services were performed within a reasonable amount of time, considering the complexity, importance, and nature, uh, and with respect to a professional person, um, whether the compensation was based on customary compensation by comparable skilled people. Right? And after consideration and review of the severed interim application, I grant it in full. The issues related to Ms. Freeman have nothing to do with respect to whether Latham should be paid for its services. He certainly had nothing to do in connection with anything that happened in September, which is what the interim application notes. Right, uh, Nothing in this application even remotely suggests it. Latham has expressed in writing to the Equity Committee um, and apparently to the United States trustee that it knew, had no knowledge of anything in the matters that re respect to former Judge Jones before it was discussed in the media. I take them at their word. They're officers of the court, and I take them at their word, and I have no evidence in front of me to suggest otherwise. The fact uh, that Ms. Freeman may have spoken with Latham on a few occasions doesn't mean Latham shouldn't be paid here. I repeat, there's no evidence or even smoke of evidence about Latham engaging in any improper behavior. Looking at the interim application, 
interim fee pay statement in September, and I find uh, that to the contrary, that they have. I take comfort that Latham is actually billing in their statements uh, their time and expenses and what they worked on and how they worked on it and that they comply with U.S. trustee guidelines. There's nothing wrong to speak of here. Um, and I also want to explain for the record, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to dovetail into the next hearing. But I, I need everybody to kind of, and it's, it's, there are statements that have been made um, in pleadings. It may have been in this one, may have been in the other one. But there's questions as to why, um, you know, that in light of re the events involving former Judge Jones, that it brings into question kind of why a case would have been filed in the Southern District. And it's not for me to here to comment on lawyer strategy. But I do need to just inform everyone of a couple of things. When a case is filed in the Southern District of Texas anywhere, it's random. Judges don't even know which cases they're going to get, right? You can't time it either. You can't, like, wait and see if a judge got one and then you file and then you get the other. It doesn't work that way. I just recently got two the other day, held two first day hearings, uh, because two cases got filed. You can't time it, and you don't know. Um, I've gotten two several times, right? Um, there may have been more. Um, the random case assignment is reset after each case is filed. So there's a 50-50 chance that every time a new set of cases is filed that I, as a judge on the complex panel, would receive it, okay? You know, this case was filed in February of 2023, which means that I would have been kind of the, for all intents and purposes, the unknown target, right? Um, I've been on the complex panel since January of 2023, but there was a 50-50 chance that I would have gotten this case. Based on the, I note for the record too, it's important because it ties to this proceeding, uh, because there was talk in the reservation uh, about um, how money, even if there was a compromise reached, how it could have been used to fund something else. That's just, that's just not true. And I need people to understand that. I would never approve that. There's a Chapter 11 plan that got confirmed, right? And based on the way the liquidation analysis worked and the way Congress has mandated priority of payment for unsecured creditors to uh, equity, there's currently not enough, right, value for Sorrento equity holders to receive a distribution or for any money to be used for any other purpose. Any money, the money that would be paid to Latham in connection with the seventh answer application is estate money. And any money that the estate uses that's not being used for administrative expenses goes to pay unsecured creditors. That's the way it works under the confirmed plan. And, and as of right now, we can take all of Latham's fees. We can take all the equity committee's fees. You can take everybody's fees. There's not enough money here to pay, and it can't be used for any other purpose. There's a confirmed plan, and Congress has mandated how that the priority scheme in which these fees are to be paid. It, there's not enough to even go to equity, and then there can't be diverted for other purposes. There's a confirmed Chapter 11 plan with a set priority of, of payments, and every dollar that doesn't get paid into, that the estate has that would be otherwise used for administrative expenses has to be used to pay unsecured creditors until they're paid in full. I, 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 unsecured creditors that have not been paid in full, um, that is what Congress has mandated. That is what Congress has mandated since 1978, since the code was passed. It is, it is not for this code court to opine on whether it's right, it's wrong. My job is to apply the law to, as faithfully as possible. The way this plan works, however, is that if there is an investment and there's a possibility of more money to come in, then possibly there's enough money to pay unsecured creditors in full and then make a recovery for equity. But the thought that money could be used to not pay professionals, one way or the other, whether they're allowed or disallowed, to be used to go fund something else is contrary to the confirmed plan. I, I, I would not approve it because I can't. And I don't, and it's also not appropriate in light of kind of what happened in connection with this. Everybody's rights are reserved on a final. And I know what Mr. Duran is saying. He says he got no problem with Latham. They haven't, they've denied it and they don't know any and, and doesn't have any evidence to the contrary, right? But final applications are still coming around. We'll wait and see. But we got to, operate based on the facts and evidence that we know currently now. I also cite Inway Werner, 783F3rd, 266-274, Fifth Circuit 2015. That's the standard. Whether the services that were rendered successful is relevant to, but not dispositive of attorney compensation. That's the standard. I'm, I'm not here, and, and I really mean it, I'm not here to stand here and approve or not approve. Every application, every standard, 
Everything that I do is based on the facts and circumstances and what the applicable law is, and I apply law to facts. That's what I do. Where the chips fall, the chips fall. I don't care. That's not my job to care. It's my job to be faithful and apply the law. In this case, there is a seventh interim application requesting fees from September 1st to September 30th based on that application, my review of it, independent of any objection, which I'm duty-bound to do. I approve it. It satisfies Fifth Circuit precedent. It is reasonable under the circumstances. I have reviewed each and every one of those fees. And the thought that money could be diverted from one to the other, I want to disillusion everyone of, the, of that possibility because there's a confirmed Chapter 11 plan and there's a liquidation analysis that shows where the money is going to go. And it will, any money is going to have to go to pay unsecured creditors, right? People who have provided services or provided, incurred debt in providing services or providing money lean to the debtor on an unsecured basis uh, have priority over those who invested. Again, there are several months here, and I've, I've never seen a Chapter 11 plan that really provides this, where you get to go a couple of months and see if there's really going to be opportunities for additional funds to come in. I, you know, I don't, I don't know where the chips fall. I don't get involved in investment decisions. I just rule on the matters that are before me based on the law. But that's the way the law operates, and I'm only looking at September 1 through September 30th. That's the very thing in front of me. I grant the application. This is, this is, I am outwardly on the record expressing my thought process and the way I uh, review every application, first interim uh, or it's a final, a final application or an interim application. You look at what the Fifth Circuit says. You look at the, the, the fees, whether one of, whether parties object, you can take up and you can look at specific fees here one way or the other, but the court still has an independent duty to review it. Uh, I believe I'm duty-bound to do so, and I believe I've uh, fulfilled that duty. So let's go to the next motion. Oh, I should say, yeah, there's a motion for 2004. I think, why don't we let, uh, why don't we let the Equity Committee go first? It's their motion. Just to be, there's a, it doesn't matter, but there's two motions. We have a motion for protective order, which we filed first, and then there's the motion for 2004. It's the same issue, so. I think they, who filed first? We filed our Motion for protective order. Ah, first. okay. Sorry. Your Honor, um, again, for the record, Cy Smith, for the equity committee, I, I think the motion for a protective order is largely irrelevant at this point. That was in connection with plan confirmation issues. And as we discussed with Your Honor before the confirmation hearing, all that is on the agenda is the 2004 motion at this point, which is, which is our motion. Um, the, the debtors made the argument in their motion for a protective order that the discovery we sought had nothing to do with, with plan confirmation. Two days before the confirmation hearing, we had a, a, an emergency conference with Your Honor, um, and we agreed to put it off, not delay, not have the 2004 motion heard on the same day of confirmation hearing, and have it as a, as a 2004 motion today. I'm okay so with I that. do think I do think it's our motion. I do think we should uh, we should go for it. Okay. First. No, no, no. I that's the way I in my head I was planning it. So, Mr. Hunt, why don't we let them go first on the 2004? Good afternoon, Your Honor. The Equity Committee seeks discovery under Rule 2004 because it has concerns about Liz Freeman's involvement in these Chapter 11 cases. And the Equity Committee has every reason to be concerned. And I want to highlight two facts that are not in dispute. They're all based on public filings which are on our exhibit list and of which the court may take judicial notice. One, on March 15th of this year, Jackson Walker in its retention application an engagement letter which was attached to its retention application, quote, strongly recommended, end quote, that Liz Freeman be engaged as conflicts counsel. At that time, by Jackson Walker's own admission, it knew of Ms. Freeman's ongoing relationship with Judge Jones. And Jackson Walker said that, represented that to the court, I think, that the case is actually, before your honor, it's the basic energy case. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a public filing where Jackson Walker made that representation to the court. So why did Jackson Walker do that? Why did it recommend, strongly recommend Ms. Freeman as conflicts counsel when it knew at the time that she had a relationship with Judge Jones? We do not know. Why did it think it was appropriate to do that? Again, we do not know. The second fact that we know, again, from public filings in this case, is that Latham and Jackson Walker consulted Ms. Freeman about issues that would not require the advice of conflict counsel. And we describe those issues in pages 15, 16 um, of our 2004 motion. 
Those issues include mediation, litigation strategy, NAT-related litigation issues, the sale process, and the UCC reconstitution, which happened earlier in the case. And, Your Honor, we, we sought answers from uh, the advisors for the debtors, and the only explanation we received to date um, was that of Jackson Walker, and the response in an email was um, that Ms. Freeman was consulted because, quote, she was asked questions about local practice and procedure a few times, end quote. So why did the debtors need Ms. Freeman's advice in local practice, given Jackson Walker's undeniable expertise in that subject matter? Again, we do not know. We hope there was no improper motive here, but we simply do not know. So, Your Honor, from our perspective, there is smoke here. We see the smoke. We can smell the smoke. But the debtors are telling us... So connect some smoke to an actual... The Equity Committee's been involved now for eight, nine months. Point to me to a ruling or something that happened in the case that says, man, there we have it, something in the wrong, right? Y'all have been involved in mediation with Latham for nine months, right? It's been Latham in the Equity Committee, my understanding. I don't think Jackson Walker's been that involved from, my, from, what, I, from what I've heard publicly. Um, but someone will correct me if I'm wrong, obviously. So the Equity Committee has been living this case for nine months. Where's the smoke? Your Honor, the, I, point to I, me to a pleading. Point to me to a ruling. Point to me to a stage in the case that says, "Man, now that boy, that's weird." So uh, I'm glad Your Honor asked this question. I'll make two points here. One, I think I just told you about one of them. The pleading was Jackson Walker's retention application. I want smoke where you said, "Here's something that happened in the case," and then Judge Jones ruled in a way that said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa what was going on here?" Which leads me to the second point, Your Honor. She was never retained as, right? She was, she was not, we, to, as far as I know, as far as we know, she was not officially retained. Well, not as far as you know. We can look at the docket, she right? She was, correct. She was consulted, though. Okay. No, 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 I agree with you there, but not formally retained. Correct. Okay. Correct, so, so where's, go ahead, I'm listening. In other words, I, I view the United States trustee, right, watchdog, they sit back. They don't sit, they sit back in the sense that they're not actively involved on the day-to-day -day operations of the case, right? They're monitoring the case. They're looking at it closely. When something comes in, they come right in. You guys have been living in it for nine months, every day, right? Mediation with Isker, uh, you know, 2004 exams, uh, litigation. What's the statement? Connect the dot for me to say, got it. Now we got to ask questions. Your Honor. Latham, of Latham. I would submit that that exactly is the point of the 2004. No, 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 but you've been living it. In other words, where is the dot that says, in other words, if, if something came out of mediation with Isger, what does that have to do with Freeman? In, in other words, if, if something came out and all of you all agreed, okay, this is going to be the route, whether we agree, disagree, comes out of mediation. I can see the United States trustee saying, hey, I wasn't in any of this stuff. But you all have been living like You're a fact witness. right? Somebody's a fact witness from the Equity Committee who's going to tell me something in here was unreasonable. It's, it's, it was the question I was going to ask you guys when it came to the, the seventh interim fee, because you guys are involved in this stuff on the day-to-day. -day. Tell me, tell me, help me understand kind of where the smoke is. You're saying there's smoke. Connect the dots for me. You were living in it, right? You were there. Help me. Tell me what it is that, that says, mm, you know, boy, why did they take Oh, man, and then they went to Jones, and then they got this. Or, or, man, there's something weird that's happening here. In light of all that happened, connect the dot in this case for me, right? What the United States trustee is doing with respect to Jackson Walker, it's about disclosure, 327. Hey, there's a question there, and those matters are being taken care of. <laughs> Incredibly serious. They're all pending before our chief judge. There are matters that are pending now, I think, in the Western District of Texas now. There's serious things going on and they're being handled seriously, I'm taking this really seriously too, and I want you to help me connect the dots. We appreciate that, Your Honor. Uh, I want to emphasize and highlight this is not a crusade against Latham. I'm not saying it's a crusade. So, connect the dots. I, I, this is important, though, Your Honor, because you mentioned earlier that Latham has represented to the court that it did not know the relationship between Judge Jones and Ms. Freeman before it became public. And we have no reason to dispute that. But 
one of the other debtor's advisors, Jackson Walker, strongly recommended her to serve as conflicts counsel while at the time she had that relationship that, that was known to Jackson Walker. So to us, Your Honor, that is smoke. Um, and S we, smoke we, of what? That's what I'm trying to get at. One of the debtor's advisors. We don't know why. But you were asking in the, one of the pleadings, like, I don't even know why they filed in the Southern District, right? Like, the, it was like, like, I don't even know what is happening in this case. Like, and and that's, that's why I'm asking all these questions. And that's why I made the statement, boy, that would have been a really bad strategy, knowing that I got a 50% chance of getting the case to have an entire strategy to try to get chosen. It would have been, anyway. I take this uh, point. But, but, but where is the, like, you're, the way the Equity Committee has proposed this is to say, Everything is confusing to us now, and that's the per that's the part where yeah. I'm confused. I I don't see the I don't see kind of the targeted like, man, what's going on here? I see like this. I don't know what is going on. I would expect that from the United States Trustee's Office because they're not involved in the day to day. But you all have been here for nine months. Where's you're saying there's smoke, and I'm looking for the smoke, and you're pointing your pleading points to like an hour of time. Your Honor, this this is not just about. Um, this is not just about time entries. This is about a suspicious fact that came out. We can call it smoke or something else. To us, it's a suspicious fact. Mm -hmm. And respectfully, Your Honor, I think it's unfair because we, we did not know of the, of the relationship between Judge Jones and Ms. Freeman until recently. They're so, saying they didn't know either. No, I understand. I'm just explaining. You, you, Your Honor asked me to point to something that happened in the case that seems suspicious, right? So I think it's a little unfair, respectfully, Your Honor, to ask us. In 60 to, days to come back and ask you, like, what's the smoke? To look back, Your Honor, to every, every little thing that happened. I didn't say case. every little thing. I'm saying point to one. Your Honor, that is that is the point of the 2004 examination. And I think it's a good segue to what 2004 is and what the standard is, um, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, to, rule 2004 permits the examination of any matter which may affect the administration of the estate. And a legitimate goal of a 2004 examination is to discover wrongdoing. Um, I'll just cite one case that holds, the, holds that. It's N. Ray Correra, C-O-R-R-E-R-A, 589 Bankruptcy Reporter 76. Um, it's Bankruptcy Court for the Northern District of Texas. And we've cited other cases holding that the scope of Rule 2004 examination is virtually unlimited, and it allows for an unrestrained fishing expedition. And, Your Honor, again, we submit that our request is not even close to a fishing expedition. We have very serious, specific concerns. What's the concern? Your Honor, I, 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 hate, being, I hate being repetitive. No, I want you to be repetitive because I want to nail down the exact concern that you have. And, and then how the 2004 that you're seeking is targeted to accomplish, to, to uh, inquire about that concern. So we, we are concerned about the fact that Ms. Freeman was consulted about issues that had nothing to do with any conflicts, subject matter, really broad issues. We only have the time entries right now, so we have mediation, we have litigation strategy, NAMP-related litigation issues, Sale process, why was Ms. Freeman consulted on these issues? We, we believe we are entitled to answers. Um, we, we, the only answer we're getting from the debtors is Latham didn't know. We'll take them at their word, but we need more information. I think this is more than enough under Rule 2004 to, um, to require an, an additional investigation into those facts, an additional disclosure. Your Honor, to, to address some of the debtors' points on this, um, the debtors argue that Rule 2004 does not abrogate privilege. Clearly, we do not argue that it does abrogate, abrogate privilege, but the answer is not to stonewall our requests altogether. There are ways to handle privilege issues, including providing a, a privilege log, and we can take it from there. Your Honor, some of our requests don't even relate to, uh, to legal advice. For example, or request number four, all documents and communications concerning any personal relationships between the debtor's advisors and Liz Freeman. We also ask for documents from Ms. Freeman directly, including any communications between her and Judge Jones. Again, those, if she was not retained by the debtors, um, we don't see how those communications, I mean, they, they could not be privileged in any event. 
So the privilege concern doesn't really, um, doesn't really defeat our motion at all. Um, and again, whether Latham knew of the relationship is not the only relevant issue. I'll note again, the document requests were to the debtors. They were not to Latham. Again, this is not a crusade against Latham. This is from information from the debtors and all of its advisors. We don't see the harm in finding out what happened here. I mean, the, the two facts that I, that I laid out before, I think are suspicious. That's our position. Um, the equity committee's constituents, Sorrento's shareholders deserve answers, Your Honor. And we believe that Rule 2004 gives them the legal right to get those answers. Um, so Rule 2004, the Rule 2004 examination is eminently appropriate here, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Chris Harris of Latham for the debtors. Um, I want to talk briefly about the procedural problems and then substantive problems about the Rule 2004 motion. Okay. So quickly on procedure, there's, there's two flaws with it. One is the equity committee failed to meet and confer with us before filing this motion, as is required under Local Rule 2004-1. Second problem is there's a pending proceeding. They just withdrew their objection to the September fees, but they have also emailed us an objection to all of Latham's October fees. And you heard them clarify that the purpose of this is an investigation into our fees. And so 2004 is not the appropriate mechanism for a pending proceeding. But let me also talk more importantly about the, the merits here. There's a number of reasons why this discovery is inappropriate. One is, is that essentially everything they're asking for is either work product or privileged. And we cited a number of cases on that point. They say, well, why don't you just give us a log? Well, our time entries disclose essentially everything that would be on a log. They disclose the time, they disclose the date of our communications with Ms. Freeman, and they disclose the topics of them as well. In addition, creating a log obviously is a cost on the estate um, to no real purpose if it's all privileged. Uh, the second and most more important point is that the only really relevant question here that the document request could answer is whether anyone at Latham was aware of the relationship before it became public. And that question has been answered, no. Um, until the press reported it, Latham had no knowledge of the relationship. And to confirm that, Ms. Reckler, who leads our engagement, contacted every attorney who works on Sorrento and all the bankruptcy attorneys at Latham firm-wide, and no one was aware of this. Ms. Reckler is here. I'm, I'm happy to call her and put her on the witness stand. If anyone has doubts about the representation that we made to the court in our filing, that no one at Latham knew this. The third issue is that unless someone knew about the relationship, there's nothing troubling about consulting Ms. Friedman. She's a very experienced and knowledgeable bankruptcy practitioner here. She's chambers ranked. We understood she had an affiliation with Jackson Walker and we could continue to consult her as a resource and that's what we did. And it's frankly insulting to suggest that the only reason anyone could possibly want to contact her is based not on her skills, but because she must have had some relationship with someone. We consulted her because she's an excellent lawyer. That's what the time entries you see reflect. We consulted her on procedural issues that she would be knowledgeable about, and that's what she did. Fourth point is to the smoke issue. There is no attempt to keep her involvement secret. As they pointed out, the Jackson Walker pre-petition engagement letter mentions her. Our time entries mention her. We had her reach out to the U.S. Trustee's Office on the debtor's behalf um, to help with the Silicon Bank Valley situation. We didn't keep her role secret because there was nothing improper to keep secret as far as we knew. So at this point, this is literally a fishing expedition. You know, there's no basis to impose the burden and, and cost, you know, a cost that will be paid by the unsecured creditors. The, the equity committee discovery. says that 2004 is a fixing expedition. That's the entire purpose of it. What's your response to that, right? That's what they're saying. They're saying they think they're smoking. They're entitled to papers. I'm going to push both of your sides here. Sure. Why, 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 why not give them a 2004? Because there has to be a basis. There has to be a reason they're, they're, to impose they're saying, this. They're cost. saying that there's some time entries and they want more information about them. There's time entries that show that she was consulted. There's nothing indicating that Latham had any knowledge. And they're saying they take us at our word. And I'm happy to put on a witness to show that if anyone doubts that. So once you have that frame of mind, that we didn't know, whatever we consulted her on, 
has nothing, does not make anything about the consultation improper or Latham's use of her improper because we didn't know. Just so it wouldn't be improper to consult anyone at Jackson Walker or anyone else who might help the debtors like she, she could. So that's why you don't do Rule Title 2004 and impose that cost on an estate for nothing. What would be learned? Let me ask, put it this way. Their point is we don't know what we're going to learn. But what the relevance of what they would learn couldn't affect the propriety of Latham's fees. Because if we didn't know about her role, which no one is challenged, then the reason we consulted her on this motion or that motion has nothing to do with the propriety of, of Latham's actions and its fees. The other thing I'd point out on that is if they really want to know more about this issue, it, it's curious they're not even seeking discovery from Jackson Walker, which I think just shows this isn't really about Liz Freeman. This is an attempt to use innuendo and burden to pressure a deep pocket try and extract a fee concession. I, I get that, but it's not costless to the estate. Why do I need to get involved into who they ask? I'm sorry, can you? Why do I need to get involved in terms of who they ask? The, the request before me is a 2004 with respect to Latham and Ms. Freeman. Why do I need to get involved in, in order of action? You may have asked them, you may not ask them, but I'm saying, but for purposes of today, why do I need to, why do I care? The only reason it's relevant that they haven't sought discovery from Jackson Walker is because it shows I think the reason for the discovery, since clearly the people who have the most knowledge of Ms. Freeman's relationship would be Ms. Freeman and Jackson Walker. So if that's the purpose of this, why are they coming to Latham? Why are they trying to find out why we consulted people? In other words, you, you may have done it. I'm just saying that's not before me today, right? I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to cut Ms. Ms. Harris off. We, I just want to correct something. Um, our requests were to the debtors, not just Latham. We requested information from the debtors as a whole and their advisors, not just Latham. So just wanted to correct that point. Thank you. Okay. Just a couple other points then, Your Honor. One is, you know, they mentioned Jackson Walker's pre-petition engagement letter. Mr. Cavanaugh is here from Jackson Walker. He can explain better. But on its face, this was a pre-petition letter. It was before the case was assigned. I, I don't Your need Honor, to know because I knew she wasn't she wasn't retained and she wasn't retained and there was a 50 50 chance of me getting the case so uh, at the time exactly so the, the only other point I'd make is you know you asked what they, they probably asked about me more <laughs> leave it there for the smoke question yeah I, I just want to make sure your honor I'm sure you're aware because you went back through everything that happened but at the time that this case was, by the time this case was assigned to Judge Jones and throughout his tenure handling this case, the equity committee only objected to one thing that the debtors did, and that was to close the auction instead of having, um, for the, the Oramid bid instead of reopening it. That's it. So if you're looking for something questionable, there's nothing out there other than that one thing, and that deal never even closed, because as everyone knows, we then shifted after that. So there is no smoke, there is nothing that reflected a bias. There is not, there's no there there, either in terms of Latham's knowledge or how you know, the, the court's prior rulings could have been affected. Who were the primary parties who were involved? No, I don't mean like on a day-to-day, -day, and I don't want substance. I just want to know who was in the room with Isker most of the time. Uh, that'd be Ms. Reckler on our behalf. And who, who else? Who, who on behalf of the debtors was there all the time, most of the time? Remember, who was lead? It was me and Mr. Meggie. Okay. And? And Mr. Schinderman and Mr. Glenn. Those are the parties that were with Isker for months? Yes. Okay. Unless Your Honor has more questions for us all. Nope. Um, let's see if anyone. Mr. Cavanaugh, I, I don't, I know you asked me for an opportunity. I don't know if, I don't know what you're going to say, so I don't know if now's the time or if later is the time or, or, or if you even choose to speak. I, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is if, if you elect to speak, now's the time but I'll let you choose to do it or not. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll be very brief, and I won't belabor the point. I think it's Your Honor, Your Honor obviously gets the very important distinction about the date of the engagement letter that was pre-petitioned before the judge assignment, which I think that's a, a, a very important point, and uh, I'm, I'm glad Your Honor recognizes that. But, Your Honor, there has been a lot of paper flying around, and as you know, uh, much has been made in the pleadings and in open court surrounding the unverified news reports concerning Judge Jones and the litigation commenced by the Office of the United States Trustee. 
I take those issues and allegations and the issues associated with those allegations very seriously and with the respect they deserve, and my firm is addressing those concerns in due course. But as Your Honor knows, that is not why we're here today. Uh, I think it's important for Your Honor and the parties to separate all the noise from the signal. And I appreciate that is no easy task, but if you'll allow, I'd like to try and, and see if I can help Your Honor with that list. I just want you to know, if, if what you're going to give me is a statement in defense of Jackson Walker, I'm not interested in it. I, I, I just I think there's other matters going on, and I, and it's not to say that I believe you or don't believe you. I just know that there are other things going on, and I don't want to get involved in it. it it's about the 2004 and, and the appropriateness of the discovery, Your Honor. I mean, that's what I think is, okay. is at heart and what, what's here. I mean, that's essentially why we are here. It's, it's the dispute dis, uh, surrounding the 2004 request. That discovery, again, focuses on the noise, not the signal, and it's a threshold Threshold matter, Your Honor, it's important to remember why that discovery was originally served. It was served in connection with uh, their objection to confirmation. At that, at that hearing, though, in November 28th, the Equity Committee admitted that uh, it, that's really not why they wanted the documents. They just thought it was an easy way to get those documents. That's not a proper purpose, purpose of 2004, Your Honor. That's not a proper purpose for sending discovery. Uh, again, they've pivoted to uh, serving it in connection with the fee objection. Uh, then it was uh, to address, you know, uh, there are questions surrounding liquidity. Again and again, uh, they will pivot on the on the on the purpose and the motive for uh, that 2004 discovery. On its face, Your Honor, that is not a proper basis uh, to serve discovery. But that too, Your Honor, uh, you know, was also noise and 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 not signal. Uh, they've made a, a a filing on Friday where they again pivoted uh, on their basis without identifying. Uh, a specific nexus or concern uh, to the allegations that they've raised. Your Honor, my mother used to tell me when people show you who they are, you should believe them. And they've shown us over and over again at least three times what they were about with this discovery. It's chasing tantalizing and unverified headlines without evidence in hopes of extracting a financial ransom. That is not a proper basis for discovery and should not be entertained by the court. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the court may have. Nothing. Thank you. Your Honor. Tom Kirkendall on behalf of Elizabeth Freeman. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll be uh, the briefest of all the attorneys uh, in the case. I appreciate uh, Mr. Harris's comments, um, and I also want to point out that Ms. Freeman is deferring to uh, Latham with regard to this matter. I mean, she's had a very superficial and very small involvement in regards to this case, as the, as the court is aware. She helped uh, prepare the case for a filing. She's had no involvement post-petition uh, post uh, except to provide some consulting advice, frankly, to friends. She's charged no one, neither Jackson Walker nor the estate, nor will she. I did want to point out, though, that the recusal standard in the Fifth Circuit with regards to a judge is... I don't want to go there. Well... I don't want to go there. I understand. But, I don't want to go there, Mr. Kirkendall. All right. I want to stick to 2004. All right. Well, my point is... I is, don't want to point, Mr. Kirkendall, if, if it's going to go there. I'm not going to make a point with regard to refusal. My point is, is is that with regard to the 2004 exam, it needs to be uh, an objective standard, uh, not one that is suspicious and that is seeking discovery based upon salacious rumors and uh, hearsay. It needs to be done by an objective standard, and that's what I believe will get here today by the court. Again, Ms. Freeman defers to Latham with regard to any of the discovery. I would point out one last thing, Your Honor, uh, uh, that the committee did not, uh, in her response to the discovery request, uh, Ms. Freeman informed the committee that there were no communications between her and Judge Jones. And so uh, if they want to take uh, a 2004 exam and have her state that on the record, under oath, she's more than willing to do so. But that was that has already been conveyed to the to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, Cy Schmidt for the Equity Committee. I'll be brief, just responding to a few points. Yes, sir. One, um, Mr. Harris said that the only relevance of our two thousand four motion is to Latham's fees. That that's not that's not correct, Your Honor. If there's any wrongdoing here, there may, be, there may be other things our constituents may want to pursue. If there was any wrongdoing, there could be claims. Again, we don't know, but that's the that, that's whole point of us seeking the information. Um, that ties into the point of a, uh, a pending contested matter. Your Honor, there are still 
final fee applications to be filed. You know, they're not pending, and we're allowed to seek 2004 um, information discovery that may be used in the context of those fee applications. So I think that argument doesn't work. Lastly, Your Honor, the, the meet and confer issue, I think our pleading... Uh, I'm not worried about that. Okay. I actually have one more point in connection with Mr. Kavanaugh's statement. I understand the engagement letter was uh, Jackson Walker's engagement, engagement letter was pre-petition. However, it was filed with a retention application post-petition. And it could have been amended to exclude um, the strong recommendation for the debtors to use Ms. Freeman in these Chapter 11 cases. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Anyone else wish to be heard? Okay. So before the court is a request for a Rule 2004 exam filed by the Official Committee of Equity Security Holders, um, the was an initial request. Equity Committee is correct. The court um, considered uh, had a status conference and agreed to defer consideration of 2004 until after plan confirmation. So uh, I'm not going to hold that against them. Um, we. We all agreed that that's exactly what we would do and why. Uh, and so the scope of the request goes to the, the matters that have been made public with respect to Ms. Freeman and former Judge Jones' questions and about, about an hour worth of post-petition billable time uh, filled in, in Latham uh, time records where uh, it was disclosed that Ms. Freeman was consulted. And for the reasons there, um, court is jurisdiction under 28 U.S.C. 1334. This is a court proceeding under 28 U.S.C. 157B. Uh, certainly concerns the administration of the estate. Um, I do, there are a couple of procedural hurdles. I'm, I'm going to find that the meet and confer uh, was probably satisfied at, at our status conference where everybody kind of talked about it there. Um, so in the pending proceeding, I don't have an active, pers well, don't have one actively in front of me now. So I, I think I'll put that to the side as well. So rule 2004B, the Federal Rules of Bankruptcy Procedure provides that the court may order the examination of any entity relating to the acts, conduct, or property, or to the liabilities and the financial condition of the debtor, or to any matter which may affect the administration of the debtor's estate or the debtor's right to a discharge. Uh, because Rule 2004 provides that the court may order the examination of any entity, the plain meaning uh, grants the bankruptcy court's complete discretion in determining whether a Rule 2004 is appropriate. That has been been noted as the scope, bankruptcy courts have noted that while the scope of a 2004 examination is unfettered and broad, it could allow for a fishing expedition, but it's not unlimited. And again, I'm kind of a big text person, so bankruptcy court here has complete discretion as to whether to allow a 2004 exam or, or not. I want to note that the, the, the matters that are raised in the pleading are incredibly serious, and they're being addressed in an incredibly serious manner. The circuit issued statements, put things on the record, publicly disclosed. Matters have been transferred to the Western District of Texas. There are, I believe, it's 17 different matters that are filed with 60 B motions filed by the United States trustee with respect to uh, retention applications concerning Jackson Walker. Those matters, uh, miscellaneous proceeding has been opened, and those matters have been now uh, pending before Chief Judge Eduardo Rodriguez, a chief bankruptcy judge, to rule on uh, a report and recommendation with respect to whether the motion to withdraw the reference to allow the U.S. trustees motions to proceed um, with the district court. Those matters are pending before. I've transferred, I have 13 of them. I transferred all 13. All the bankruptcy judges, Judge Isker had about three. Judge Rodriguez had one. They're all pending in a miscellaneous proceeding. Judge Rodriguez uh, is going to handle that. And if the, if the district court uh, takes it, then the district court takes it. If the district court, uh, I don't know what Judge Rodriguez, I don't know what the report and recommendation Judge Rodriguez will issue. That's that's before Judge Rodriguez, and I don't get involved in that. But the order that we sign says that if somehow the, the bankruptcy court does resolve it, then, then all pretrial matters will, hand, will be handled before Chief Judge Rodriguez. So really, really serious stuff being taken, really, really serious. I push both parties today because back on the record in Sorrento, I, I take the matters that have been described and the allegations in there incredibly serious. So I start with the text. It says that it's the bankruptcy court may order a 2004. Question is, is one appropriate here? I pressed the equity committee today. Maybe a little too hard. I don't know. I apologize if I did it. Kind of the smoke. What, what, what is the basis? What is the need for a 2004? Right. There are matters that are investigating all of these issues pending going on. What is the need to have one today? We have about you know, an hour worth of work, a pre-petition retention document, 
I don't think you can just look at that in light of where we are in connection with this case. You've got to look at the entire case and what has been happening to see whether something went on, in my opinion. All right, this case has been going on now for a long time. The main complaint that I heard when I got on this case was that fees were running rampant, right? This case was getting too expensive and the parties needed to find an exit. Parties filed a plan. The plan got confirmed. Still some work to be done because there's a an exit if someone can come up with the money. I've already addressed that reducing fees here isn't going to address that problem. Someone's going to have to come up with money. I hope they do. I want to, I would love for everyone in equity to get paid. I don't get involved in those decisions. My decisions are, are just based upon the present situation. I, I went back and I looked over this case and here's what I know. And I'm sure parties can tell me far more detail, but here's what the docket shows. This case was filed on February 13th, right? About a month into the case, there's a motion requesting appointment of an equity committee. The motion comments that there was a there was frustration at the time about the formation of the creditors committee, um, stating that there's no way that a, another entity called Nansel should have been on the committee. There was some, and that there, and Judge Jones commented that he truly he hoped there was a truly independent committee. And on March 2nd, lawyers contacted the United States the Office of the United States Trustee to determine whether an equity committee was going to be appoint, appointed. And at that time, the trustee hadn't provided a formal response, and so they, they went in front of Judge Jones asking for appointment of a committee. And Sherry Han was involved there, one of the most respected bankruptcy lawyers in this district. Right? Jones, at the hearing, I go back to the transcript, says, Sherry Han stands up to say something, at least in this courtroom, I'm going to listen. You know I've known you. Uh, for about 30 years, you don't stand up and speak for the sake of hearing yourself. When you get up to make a point, I haven't always agreed with you over these years, but I respect what you have to say when you stand up. So Chair Han then stands up and says, Judge Jones, that at a hearing, says uh, there's going to be a mediation before Judge Isker in May, and we want to be at the table. Jones at the transcript says, I want you to be at the mediation. About two weeks later, there's an agreed order directing the appointment where the bankruptcy court directs the appointment of official equity committee. The debtors are part of this agreement. It was absolutely part of judicial discretion to say no. The debtors had no obligation to agree. I don't, I don't get involved in why or what happened. I just know that it happened. So now that's February. In April, two months into the case, about 25 2004 exams are served on numerous banks and financial institutions. The equity committee is now formed and counsels retained. Two firms. That same month, there's a motion to sell Silex stocks and related procedure. Right? On May 11th, the Equity Committee at Docket 594 files an emergency motion seeking to compel certain brokerage firms' compliance with various regulatory requirements. A day later, without a hearing, that motion is signed by the bankruptcy court. Later that month, the brokerage firms start filing certifications of compliance. On May 23rd, the Equity Committee files a proposed amendment to the compel at Docket 675, which is signed by the court that same day at 681. On June 6th at Docket 810, the debtors file a motion approving and implementing mediation settlement conducted by Judge Isker. Right? They file a motion seeking approval of it. That motion says that the debtors previewed the relief requested with the trustee, the dip lenders, the unsecured creditors committee, and the equity committee, but the equity committee was still evaluating requests at the time. In mid-June, the bar date gets entered. In late June, the debtors file motions seeking to, to secure junior dip financing. Minor comments from the equity committee are discussed at the hearing, and the interim order is entered in July, right? In that same month of June, the equity committee starts an adversary case against certain banks, 2303016. The equity committee asks for a TRO, and it's granted one day later. The banks file an emergency motion asking to convert a June 27th at the evidentiary hearing into a status conference. The equity committee objects. Court sides with the equity committee. An agreed order is signed extending the TRO. In July 28th, the Equity Committee files a notice of voluntary dismissal of the adversary proceeding. On July 12th, the debtors in the Equity Committee file a joint emergency motion for an order approving an offering and related procedures and authorizing entry into settlement with certain participating record holdings of Silex. On, right, an order approving that was entered on July 18th, six days later. On July 24th, the debtors file an emergency motion. And this is where we get into the $200 million proposal from Hunter Gain providing exit financing. The Equity Committee asks for a continuance. The process is not pressed. Then the debtors file a motion to file a replacement dip in August. The debtors say they're running out of liquidity and pursuing various capital-raising transactions. On July 
expected to use the proceeds to fund operations and to repay this, the dip facility. Um, the debtors expressed concerns at the time with Hunter Gain, with the 100 gain transaction, and the CRO ultimately decided not to seek approval of that. About a month later, the debtors seek an order authorizing, among other things, the sale to Silex. And then around that time, the news comes out. Right? That's the history of this case, folks. I approved the disclosure statement. I confirmed the plan. The equity committee is fully involved in this at all times. They've been involved in mediation for eight months. Look, I'm sure I'm missing details, but not on the months. Not in terms of what happened from February till October when I got involved, late October. I, I don't see I don't see a decision. I don't see rumblings, what's going on, where things are. I see 2004 exams getting signed the same day. <laughs> you know, TROs getting signed the same day. I see objections getting, you know, people winning, people I see shifting up there. I see everyone parties participating in mediation for several months in front of another judge. You're asking me whether it's 2004, and I know that there are other matters that are being investigated now, right? That are not in front of me now, that are being handled in front of where the United States trustee is is taking is conducting an investigation as to matters, and and those matters will run their course. I see matters that are handling another course. Like I don't see the need for a 2004 now. I don't see it. I've heard what's happening, or that what's happening, I'm pressing the equity committee. The equity committee at all stages has been involved, but they've been an, an active participant in what is going on, and you can't act like you haven't been there. You can certainly say, I am surprised about what happened. That's what Latham is telling me. Didn't let Jackson Walker give me any statements about kind of where, where things stand, because I understand that's going to run its course, and that'll have they'll have their day in court. Didn't let uh, Mr. Kirkendall go too far in statements that he may have prepared, right? That process will, will, will play itself out. The question is, do I grant a 2004 exam based upon the facts and the history that I have here? And the answer is no. The, the rule to a 2004 is not unlimited. And then I consider, which just happened earlier today, which is where somebody filed on the docket requesting, you know, that money be shifted outside of the plan context to then go and pay to go fund something outside of what the plan would have provided, outside of what I would have even permitted, outside of what even a request of the bankruptcy court. I, I don't see the need for a 2004 exam today, but I agree with Mr. Duran. We know what we know now. If anything changes, somebody will file asking for stuff. But that's where we are today, folks. I appreciate it. I take the matter seriously. I think the equity committee had every right to come in and ask for it. And I got to look at the whole case. And I'm just providing a snapshot of what happened in these months. And, and I'm trying to provide as to why I'm pressing as to where the smoke is. What, what was the ruling? What's the aha? What's the, that creates, it's different than disclosure issues on 327, right? That the law requires certain things and the bankruptcy rules require certain things and, and parties will have their day in court to go decide those issues. They're not, that's not for me to rule on today. But what is, what I'm being asked for today is a 2004 exam to uncover, to ask questions about you know, pre-petition statements. And again, I clarify, there's a 50-50 chance that I get this case. Just noting for the record kind of where we are and where things stand today, I'm going to deny the request for a 2004. I'm being told that as a result of that, based on the statements earlier, there's no need for a protective order. I'll sign and enter an order. I would note bankruptcy courts have absolute discretion. Party's always free to come back if they feel like they need to. If there's an objection to the October fees, you now have the benefit of my thought process and the way that I, I think about every one of these applications. Whether they whether there's an objection or not, you now know my thought process and the way I approach them. I read them all, think about the law, think about the statements, and I encourage the parties continue to work on value maximizing prospect. I know objection to fees is always right, a little bit testy, but but I'm gonna take debtors counsel out there where they're going to continue to work productively with creditors committee, the equity committee, to try to see if there's a value maximizing proposition out there. And if there is, y'all are going to come back to court and we'll put it on notice and we'll, we'll take it up at the time. But that's my ruling. Thank you very much. Have a good day.